As in the case of our first panel, they will each introduce themselves to you and they will give you their version of what brought them into the realm of recovery. I've heard so many people today that had a handle on what was happening to them, alcoholism, drug and substance abuse, um, and I, I'm, it's remarkable to me. I uh, wasn't an alcoholic, I only drank. <laughs> so it, it, it came as quite a surprise to me that the constant drinking did render me to be an alcoholic. Um, I wanted to participate today because I don't know what other people's reasons were for doing what they did. I'm, I'm thinking a lot about uh, addiction. Why are people addicted? And we've heard talk of addictions to gambling, addiction, uh, addictions to this, that, and the other. Uh, primary addiction is an addiction to fear which we all have and a lot of us don't acknowledge, but we do acknowledge in other ways. We smoke cigarettes, um, we overeat, we shop. My response was that I was attempting to respond uh, to wash away the memories of a, a sexual assault. I was a rape victim and I wanted to bring that out because I, I realized that there are a lot of ladies that have experienced that and don't know quite how to go forward from that. So uh, that was my response. I didn't know if what my uh, blame was in that. I know it was uncomfortable, but primarily I was ashamed of that fact. I was ashamed. I didn't want to remember it. I didn't want to be awake. And I had a low tolerance to alcohol, so I drank a little and then I would go to sleep. And I was very respected in my family, and uh, I was kind of private, even though I was very well loved and respected in my family. I would come around and, and play with the children and participate with the adults, and then I was always the studious type, and I would go away and be by myself. Um, when this happened to me, I told no one that I was savagely raped by two men. But, of course, I was painfully aware of it, and I started to just, I know if I drank a little bit, I would go to sleep. And then sleep became my friend. I was no longer... Um, awake and in reality. And so thus I began to drink more and more because uh, I would stay asleep, but I wasn't an alcoholic, I only drank. So I'm, I'm uh, grateful to say that uh, I went through a series of things in my shame of what happened to me and what was put upon me that I started to veer away from my family. I didn't want to be in the same area where it happened and I was ashamed for some reason I could never fathom. And thus, uh, through a series of drinking and um, uh, having more tolerance to alcohol, uh, I started to black out and have all kinds of things happen to me and wake up in strange places and not wanting to go home in the untempt condition that I was in. Gradually, um, in my state of homelessness, I went to a shelter, St. Martin de Porres House of Hope, um, uh, near uh, the lake in Hyde Park. And after a while, I was uh, introduced to a program called the Arts Services, uh, Act, Act Resources for the Chronically Homeless, uh, which was a very good thing. Instead of drinking and feeling hopeless and coming from a feeling of hopelessness and fear, I had a, a good support system with this particular social service organization, which I want to... 30 seconds. <laughs> okay. I want to say that in these 30 seconds that I'm very grateful to have come into a new frame of mind and to have recovered and discovered, which is recovery is, discovery of your former self. And no one be afraid to look out and receive help and ask for help. It is out there. Thank you. My name is Leon Fullerlove. I'm a recovered alcoholic. Well, I'm grateful that thanks to the power of my that brought me forth to the art program because I used to drink just to fit in because I always felt that as long as I had a drink, I could blame everything on the alcohol and not myself. So by being in this program, it gave me a second chance to be respected by my family members, to get more involved. And how I got involved with the art program, I was at a shelter, they said, the Matthew House on 37th in Indiana. And they came through and they went through a bunch of serious interviewing us and what have you. And I said, like all other programs, it wouldn't work because I had my doubts to listen to other people until I really realized that, no, it won't work if I don't work with it. So I found out I couldn't beat the system. I might as well join. So now I'm 
unemployed. I'm working every day. I got beautiful apartment, and all this through the power of the art program, which you know they worked with us. They had good staff people that understood where I was coming from, where I needed to go. Because I have gave up on myself, but they never did give up on me. And that's something what we all want to say. We blame other people for our downfalls until we really realize and get respect within yourself so other people respect you. If you feel like you ever stayed in the shelter, it's nothing nice. You know, you got to get in at a certain time. You got to leave at a certain time. And probably they treat you like you're not a citizen, which you're not. You're just a person. You go into different places. People ask you, they see you with a backpack, what you need, get out. But now when I walk in the place, I go in, I get well respected. People look at me, and I'm a knowledge. And it's a good feeling to have your family members happy to see you instead of happy when you leave. You know, I always thought I didn't have a problem until I was put in treatment. And first of all, people always said treatment don't work. No, it don't work if you don't work with it. You got to put something in in order to get something out. So I know if it helps someone like me to be back a, a pillar of society, then I ask for it, where people walk away from you across the street when they see you coming and say good morning to you now and says, hey, God love you and so do I. So with that, I know my time is running out, but we all get a second chance, and the art program gave that to me. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bobby Recovering. Uh, past 30 years of my life, I'm 54. The past 30 years of my life were surrounded around crack, cocaine, heroin, and alcohol. Well, it's been five years now. I haven't had any of the above. I was out there bad on that stuff. When I was under the influence of crack, cocaine, heroin, and alcohol, I didn't care about me, you, wife, house, car, kids, bill, or nobody in this room. So I know recovery works today because I can look at each of you and say, I love you. See, I know recovery works because I'm here. I'm not at the crack house. See, I could have chosen went to. I know where they're puffing at right now. But look where I'm at. See, recovery works. Do you see what I'm saying? I could be there right now instead of here. Uh, the past five years of my life has been great. Kids, grandkids back in my life. My kids back in my life. I'm employable today. My self-esteem is back to where I want it today. Because of drugs and alcohol, I stayed in out the Cook County Jail. It had became a way of life for me. Like the brother there showed, I don't been down there in five, six more. But it, it saved my life, them two and three-year bits. It's a way of God saving my life. I can remember getting in the police car, telling them, yeah, help them get me to the Cook County Jail. To come off them drugs, to get the chance to Think and see where my life is hidden. People ask me all the time now, Bobby, we knew how bad you was. I said, what happened? Was it church? No, I go to church. Was it the means? No, I make means. I got tired. So some of my friends, like, they're still using it. They wonder what happened to me. Bobby, we can't believe you stopped using What happened, Bobby? I got tired. Drinking, drug, and stealing to the penitentiary is a domino effect. If I drink and drug, I'm finna go steal something. I'm back at the joint. Every now and then when I'm at home, some, I look in the mirror, I do this. I say, Bobby, if you don't drink and drug, you ain't got to go steal. You ain't going back to the penitentiary. Every now and then I find myself standing in my own mirror saying that. Don't drink and drug today, Bobby. <laughs> as long as you don't drink and drug today, Bobby, you ain't finna go steal nothing. You ain't got to go back to Pontiac. Along come the arts program back here in 04. I'm involved with the arts program. And it's, I've been in that program four years now. They helped me to rebuild my life. I thank God for that program, of this program. It's been four years now. I'm off the street. I got a different attitude today. I got a different outlook on life. Drugs no longer is, is a part of my life today. When I'm asked, walking down the street by drug dealers today, Bobby, is you straight? Yes, I'm straight. And I say to myself, I don't say it to them, but while I'm walking, you won't get this five or ten to put in your gas tank or pay your rent with. I don't say that to them. I say that to myself while I'm still walking. I'm so grateful today. And uh, i just like to end with recovery works. I know it works because I'm here, and I'm not at the smokehouse. I'm not at the shooting gallery where they're they shooting dope at right now. Thank you. My name is Reuben Warren. I'm a recovering alcoholic and drug abuser. 
I started drinking about, when I was about 14 years old. And if I could have a dime for every drink that I've drank, I'd be rich now. Hmm. I just started drugging until I was 48 years old. And I found out it was a waste of my time, a waste of my money. I slept in my car, delivered meals on wheels to senior citizens. I didn't rape, rob, steal, and carry on because I didn't have to, always worked. I have a bachelor's in criminal justice. I'm six hours away from my master's, and I still won't go back to school for it. I want to, and I intend to. But when I was down, I didn't care. I had a car. I can go anywhere I want to go. Gas. I didn't worry about it because I got paid every morning. So I was at the, I got paid at 530 at 6 o'clock. I was at the liquor store. Then I decided, what am I doing to myself? Why am I doing this to me? You go to the doctor and he tells you that you, you ain't going to make it. Well, I am going to make it because I changed my mind. The arts program is like an umbrella over me. It keeps me dry. It keeps me from going out there doing stupid stuff. Keep it simple, stupid. That's all. Keep it simple. You don't have to hurt yourself, anybody else. What you have to do is work with yourself to get yourself back to where you want to be. You want to be light? Work with yourself. You want to have something? Work with you. Nobody's going to give you anything, but you can't go out and take it, and you can't take life for granted. All the alcohol in the world can't bring back the things that I, you can't change the stuff. So I gave it up and I don't intend to use it anymore. Why? I already got a crutch. I don't need no other. Thank you for your time. Amen. We have to be grateful for such passionate and compelling stories of recovery. This is part of the power of this field and those who work in it, the type of things they aspire to do is to build and rebuild lives. In the viewing audience, you may know someone um, with a substance abuse disorder. It might be a family member, co-worker, friend, or acquaintance. Those who have lived through these experiences have the most compelling stories to tell and can truly make a difference in helping others seek treatment. The goal of this webcast is to reach several audiences, those in recovery, those who may be in need of recovery, and or those working in the field of recovery or possibly considering this field as a career option. Let me mention that after our next speaker, there will be a break. The second segment of this webcast focuses on the addiction workforce, voices for the field. The addictions field is undergoing a change. This change impacts the system of care for individuals in treatment, working towards their recovery to a system of care that looks at how the individual sustains and maintain recovery over the course of their life. Traditionally, the field has focused on problems. In a recovery system, the individual's assets help in action for recovery. I am very pleased to introduce an expert in the field who will talk about the impact of such changes on the workforce. And I want to add that this individual is also a personal friend. He's a professor at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale. He's very passionate about this field, and he will share some of his stories with you, Dr. Shane Cope. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Shane Koch. Hello, Shane. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic and drug addict. Hello, Shane. I'm sorry, I caught this pause there. <laughs> Through the grace of my higher power and with the help of the recovering community and wonderful folks like yourselves, I've not found it necessary to take a drink or a drug since August 8th of 1988, and for that, I'm truly grateful. Way to go. Now, I was one of these guys Gajif was talking about earlier, um, one of these 12-year-old guys. I began my uh, active use of alcohol and drugs at age 12 and went on a 10-year uh, binge, the last five years of which uh, I absolutely did not breathe a uh, sober or dry breath. And uh, 
you know, it's interesting when uh, I, we, we have a young man that we uh, mentor right now at SIU, and, and he said, you know what, he said, Dr. Koch, he said, I never thought, I never think that I would ever get to be a college professor. And I said to my, my young friend Jason, I said, you know, Jason, when I was your age, no one thought I'd be a college professor either. Uh, you know, I was a guy who really hit bottom and, and absolutely was hopeless. So it's a privilege to be up here with these folks and talk a little bit about workforce development, talk about things from my perspective as an educator and researcher. I'm privileged today to serve as an associate professor and director of addiction studies at the Rehabilitation Institute at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. I'm also fortunate to sit on the board of directors of the International Coalition of Addiction Science Educators and to serve as the editor of the Journal of Teaching and Addictions and the and also as co-editor of the Rehabilitation Counselors and Educators Association Journal. None of that would be possible without recovery. I've worked as a counselor, worked as a program evaluator. I actually started out my, my work as a, a direct care worker, a residential program worker in one of the oldest therapeutic, therapeutic communities in the country. Um, then worked as a counselor, program evaluator. While I was working as a counselor and uh, while I was uh, on the floor there at the therapeutic community, I finished my bachelor's degree. I went on to uh, work as an assessment specialist. While doing that, I finished my master's degree. Then I was pr privileged to move on and be able to do my doctoral work and then go back to serve as a clinical director and program director at the largest residential treatment center in the state of Ohio for uh, adolescents. Then I came back and became an educator and a researcher. None of those things would have been possible, folks, without advocacy because at each step of the way, at each tier of the progress in my own recovery, there has been a person or persons who've had faith and belief in me and who've encouraged and advocated for me when I would not have done that for myself. And you know, we're in a magical time here in the 21st century. This is a special time for our field. You know, we're at the nexus of the reformation of our professional identity. You know, we are, we, we, have, we have come kind of a full circle. We have come from folks like me who were purely recovering folks who got into the field through recovery my sponsor told me, I shared with a colleague earlier, he said, you know what? He said, you're the most childish guy I've ever seen. He said, you need to go and work with those kids up there at that therapeutic community. And you know what? You'll either grow up or they'll kill you. Right? And that was how I got in the field. Right? That's how I got in the field. Right? Well, today, I think there's still a lot of folks who are out there who've got in the field because of their own recovery, through their own experiences. Maybe they have a sponsor, or maybe they have someone they know in recovery, or maybe they have someone they know in the field who invites them and, and, and allows them to participate. What I hope is that we maintain our connections with those folks because we need recovering persons in our field. We need to bring them into the field. More than that, we need to advocate for those recovering persons to be able to advance themselves and to reach their full potential. We need to advocate for them so that they can actualize their abilities, so that they can be able to perform as independent, productive members of our society. One theme I hear again and again, and all the folks who spoke earlier, and a theme in my own recovery is employment. You know what? The biggest thing for me about National Recovery Month is we get out in public and we say, look, we are people you can count on. We are people you can depend on. We are people you can trust. We are people that you can bring into your work environment and you can hire us. Because you know, in the United States of America, if you don't have a J-O-B, you don't have anything. It's very difficult for us in our society to be able to move forward and to support our families and to really participate. Because those J-O-Bs, right, they're critically, critically important. So what's that mean for our addictions workforce? Well, that means that these new jobs in this new field, we have a new blending kind of initiative that we need to take care of. Not the blending initiative that SAMHSA talks about. It's a new kind of blending initiative. It's the blending of the professional community with the recovering community. You know, and I have two hats, right? I wear two hats. I'm Shane the recovering guy, right? I'm also Shane the addictions educator. Maybe I got a couple of other hats there too, I guess, as I think about it, right? But the reality is, that we've got to bring those two things together. And we've got to stop thinking about ourselves as being separate because we have a symbiosis. We are interdependent. Without the recovery community, we have no treatment community. Without the treatment community, I would assert it would be very difficult for our recovery community to truly thrive. Alcoholics Anonymous in their 2004 membership survey indicated that 75% of their members were in Alcoholics Anonymous because of direct contact with professional treatment providers. Isn't that fascinating? 
So wherever, wh wherever we started at the beginning of this journey, however this was meant to be, right, or however this was visualized, we have changed and adapted and grown to a place that I think none of us could visualize. However, I do think Bill W., you know, creative guy that he was, he said something 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago that we should listen to today. Maybe some of you all have heard it. He said, be quick to trust your friends in medicine and religion. Be quick to trust your friends in medicine and religion. He didn't say, make fun of counselors. He didn't say, make fun of education. Education will make you stupid. It'll make you not able to work with recovering people. Bill said, be quick to trust friends. And you know what? Here it is all these years later, and we're just beginning to welcome faith-based communities into recovery. We just figured that out, I guess. Bill said it when? Back in 1935. We finally listened to him, right? We finally listened to him. And we're finally listening to this idea of welcoming our trained professionals. And I think the reason that Bill urged us to do this was, if you notice from his story, the folks who advocated for him were all these caring, wonderful earth people. They were professional folks who were not in recovery, but they took an interest in this hopeless, otherwise useless human being and they helped him restore his life so that he became an example for the rest of us. So if we're to solve this challenge of the 21st century, there's some things we've got to do. We've got to advocate for our consumers. We've got to preserve their human dignity because we represent a population of people who have long suffered by stigma, discrimination, and prejudice. Right? You know, I think back to all the people who overcame, you know, their response to me. You know, the folks in the recovery community, because I was different. Like, I came in at 23, I had hair down to my waist, and I'd been living out with these kind of crazy folks doing crazy things. And, you know, it was kind of interesting for me. I came into AA around a lot of folks who were not a lot like me, but you know what? They welcomed me and they advocated for me. You know, later on, it was time for me to get my first research job. Guess what? It was Gadget McNeil. Stood up, gave me my very first job as a researcher. Right? Trusted me, encouraged me, empowered me. You know, when I went to my doctoral program, I had no idea I could do that, right? I was a hopeless drug addict, right? Guess what? It was Dr. John Benchoff who said, you know what? You can do this. Those people, I think, are real heroes. They're the folks who take the risk and take the chance on us. And they're the folks who carry the water, really, for this recovery thing. Secondly, as I already mentioned, we need to advocate for employment, right? If we're going to welcome folks back into the community, we have to welcome them all the way back. we got to bring them all the way back. We can't bring them back and stick them in special houses or special facilities. We can't keep them in programs that last forever. We can't put them in prisons and keep them there forever. We've got to welcome them home. You know, there's this other guy you might have heard of. I think maybe you've heard of him, that Jesus of Nazareth guy. I know some of you all have heard of that guy. He tells that story of the prodigal son. They don't bring the sun back and put them out in the pens with the animals. They don't bring the sun back and isolate them or put them away or make them. A the father welcomes the sun back completely. He embraces the sun. He brings them back. I think that's what we need today. We need to embrace our brothers and sisters when they finally come home. Because we were lost. And when we finally come home, it represents a real opportunity for us. And not only for us, but I believe for you. I've been able to contribute in ways in my life that I would have never ever dreamt possible. I'm able to be a father today. I'm able to be a husband today. You know, I've been in a relationship now with my wife for, God forbid, 12 years. I have to think about it, right? <laughs> no one would think that would be possible. And without recovery, it would not be possible. Today, my father's here with me. My father wouldn't have gone anywhere with me when I was in active addiction. Education. You know what? We have increasingly complex problems we've got to face today in our field. Things are not as simple as they were 50 years ago in recovery. We are using a wider menu of substances than ever before. We are using new substances that Bill and Bob never dreamt of, right? I heard people talking about it frankly and honestly today. There's five things I think that we've got to absolutely take care of if we're going to move our workforce into the 21st century. The first is prescription drug abuse. And you know, I think I've made it first because of the, the unique challenges that, that, it, that it puts before us, particularly for me as a recovering person. 
If we're to help all these folks who've become addicted to prescription drugs, we have to do something new, something scary, something really troublesome for those of us in recovery. We have to use drugs to fight drug abuse. Now, when you think about that, it sounds pretty crazy, right? It sounds pretty crazy. And some of us have grown up in recovery cultures where we say a drug is a drug is a drug. Well, you know what? We have to adapt, folks, or otherwise sisters like our friend who shared earlier will die. Because without pharmacotherapy, many of these folks are not able to participate in the recovery community. Without the new medications that are being developed by our leading scientists like buprenorphine, right, these folks are not able to do what I was able to do. We have a saying in, in the recovery community or in the rehab community, we say everybody needs a fair opportunity to succeed. I was able to have that fair opportunity without the benefits of pharmacotherapy. But you know what? My great fear is that the young people and the older adults who are being victimized by, by prescription drug abuse, they will not have that fair opportunity without the benefit of medical help. And that's a major challenge for us. It, it involves us to rethink many of the, the ideas that we hold dear. Secondly, I mentioned briefly aging. You know, right now the mean age in the recovering community is 48 years old. Less than 15% of the folks in the recovering community are over the age of 60. Less than 15%. Well, I don't know if you notice it, but those baby boom guys that came just before me, or maybe I'm on the tail end of it, I guess, they're getting a little older, and they're about to inundate us with a whole new set of issues, like ageism, right? Like prescription drug abuse, like coexisting disabilities. Coexisting disabilities are those folks who experience medical and physical problems in addition to their substance abuse. Guess what, guys? <coughs> Pardon me. Nothing in my own recovery experience prepared me to serve persons with coexisting disabilities. Regardless of how powerful my experience has been, I do not have personal experience with that. So if I'm going to be in the workforce and I'm going to help older adults and I'm going to help prescription drug abuse, I have to go out and get further training. I have to go to specialized programs that can give me those knowledge and skills that enable me to serve effectively. Because that's what it's about. Do we not have an ethical obligation to provide effective and appropriate services? Do we not have an obligation to provide services that are individualized, that we meet people's needs? You don't need my recovery. You all need your recovery. My obligation as a professional is to give you your recovery and allow you to own it. And that's a big piece, I think, of recovery-oriented systems of care. Another passionate problem that I, or another problem I feel passionately about and challenge we have is our returning veterans. One of the things that's been discussed a lot with these young men, and, and some of them, you know, my wife and I were at the airport the other day and we ran into them. They're, they're just babies. These young men are coming back with very, very serious, serious physical challenges. I'm not sure if you know, they say the signature wound of Iraq is something called traumatic brain injury. Now, I'm a rehab counselor, so I've been working in rehabilitation for a long, long time, and I'm here to tell you, traumatic brain injury is incredibly, incredibly difficult to overcome. And these young men and women are going to need every ounce of our support and advocacy because they're going to come back and they're going to be frustrated and they're going to be hopeless and they're going to be desperate and they're going to be in despair and they're going to be fearful and they're going to be terrified and they are going to use alcohol and drugs. And we have got to be there to help bring them forward. And we're not going to be able to serve those folks without the specialized knowledge and skills that you're only going to get in advanced training. Because you know what? Nothing in my recovery prepared me to serve those young men and women. Next, I think we have another problem. It's an old problem that you've probably heard about, but it's also, I think, a new problem. And that's the problem of HIV, right? I'm passionate about HIV because I think we've missed the boat on HIV. And here's how I think the boat has sailed without us in the recovery community. We focused a lot on prevention, which is exactly what we need to be doing. We pr focused a lot on keeping the, the disease contained. But one of the things I think we've forgotten about is how do we help these folks, these persons with disabilities, these folks with chronic disabilities, who are healthy and able to function and able to be independent, how do we welcome them back into the community? And guess what? I'm not sure if you're familiar with this or not, but the reason that most people become infected through risky sexual behaviors is that they were doing what? Drugs. Hmm, alcohol and drugs. 
We've talked a lot about intravenous drug use because it's so very dangerous in terms of HIV. But you know what? Treatment is prevention for HIV. When we can get folks sober, when we can help them get into recovery, we know they're going to engage in less risky behaviors. We know that they're going to be able to move forward in their lives. And since HIV AIDS is no longer a death sentence, these are folks, too, that we need to be thinking about that other, that other issue, that J-O-B issue. How do we get these folks back to work so they can be part of our community? How can we bring these recovering brothers and sisters back, despite the fact that they are actually experiencing now double stigma, or maybe triple stigma, depending on what's up? I have a good friend. His name is Dennis Moore, and I'll close with this. He says, you know, when you have two, you usually have three, right? We have, if we have a substance abuse problem with a disability, we typically also have a mental health disorder. So again, in the 21st century, we must all work together and stop thinking of ourselves as recovering persons alone or treatment persons alone or mental health persons alone or HIV persons alone, and we've got to work together because our consumers need all of us. And without us, I don't think they can be successful. Thank you so very much. It's such a privilege to be here today.